Good morning, and we are live on a Friday morning edition of Coffee with Rich. This morning, I'm honored to be once again joined by my dear friend, Alan Kelly. And while folks are jumping on, let's talk about sponsors. We got some amazing sponsors here at the American Warrior Show and Coffee with Rich. We have sponsors like Appalachian Standard. Check them out at appmp.com. Use the discount code over there at AmericanWarriorShow.com. Matter of fact, just click the link and get everything you need for CBD products. All the hemp products, the tincture, the flower. If you're into smoking the CBD flower, I have found that it works really well for the inflammation in my joints. I have found that it helps me sleep, improved cognitive function. Some of their salves have really helped with some of my joint issues. I am very pleased with the things that Jesse and his family are doing over there at Appalachian Standard. We also had the Cool Fire Trainer. Right now, Cool Fire Trainer, I think, is a two-month backlog because of the price of ammunition. Folks are running out and buying the Cool Fire Trainer, and they should because it will take your dry fire to the next level. Why dry fire when you can cool fire? But you're going to have to be patient, folks. Demand is skyrocketed, and they are on a two-month backlog. But don't let that deter you. It's your gun, your trigger, your sights. Your grip, it's your gun. All you got to do is replace the barrel and the recoil spring, and you are going to get some amazing training value out of that product. We also have Mountain Man Medical. Mountain Man Medical for all your basic trauma needs. But right now, we still have, I think there might be 60 kits left. If you want to pick up one of the American Warrior Society and Mountain Man Medical co-branded trauma kit developed by Brian McLaughlin, former Navy corpsman, and my dear friend Justin Carroll, a former MARSOC operator and contractor, they have an amazing product over there at uh, Mountain Man Medical, the AWS co-branded trauma kit. Check out the links below, and I've got a link for you, but you better act quick. They've got about 60 more, but don't worry. They can back order those products for you. PrecisionHolsters.com, maker of the Ultra Appendix holster, as well as the competition line that I use, as well as Mr. Mike Sieglander. Uh, check out PrecisionHolsters.com. They make an amazing tactical belt, which I wear every single day. Don't leave home without it century martial arts makers of the bob xl bob xl why do cardio run on a treadmill all this stuff when you can you do cardio with your striking routine or put him in a gi top put him on the ground do a little ground and pound little lapel chokes i got a sub the other day uh by, by lapel choke they are amazing most people don't even know that's a thing check that out because this fall and winter we're going everybody's going to be walking around in jackets it's a good time to work on your lapel chokes before we actually get there. Uh, let's see, Alan, is that all the sponsor reads I got? I uh, believe so. And I think it's to the 14 folks that are joining us live. Alan, let's see who's on here with us so far. we got Tony from Brunswick, Georgia. John out there in Yukon, Oklahoma. Will in Montana. Dr. Fuller in South Carolina. Gerald in Oregon. we got the entire United States, it looks like. we got got uh, David Frazier, my good friend here in Tennessee. Walt is on from Ohio. Brian is out there in Mississippi. Simper fire, brother. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Brothers is on. Good morning. Coin number 1997. Good morning, sir. Matt Sims from Alabama. Good morning, Matt. Thank you for being on the show the other day. It was amazing. Will from Missouri. Got an amazing group of folks on. Please like and hit that share button. We are just getting started. Let me go ahead and read Alan's bio. Alan Kelly was born and raised in rural Southwest Virginia. In 1976, he was hired by the Virginia Department of Transportation to weigh commercial motor vehicles for overweight violations. In 1979, he moved on to the Washington County Sheriff's Office as a road deputy, and in 1982, was promoted to investigator. During his time with the Sheriff's Office, he had the opportunity to become one of the original general instructors under the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services' new instructor program. In 1985, he was hired by the Virginia State Police, and upon completing their academy training, was stationed in Rockbridge County, Virginia. On December the 1st, 2016, Allen retired from the Virginia State Police with 40 years in law enforcement, 31 years with the Virginia State Police. During his employment with the Virginia State Police, Allen was a road trooper and retired uh, with the rank of master trooper. In 1987, he became a firearms instructor, and in 1992, a driving instructor. Toward the end of his career with the Virginia State Police, he was a senior firearms instructor and senior driving instructor. Allen was involved with many special assignments like visiting dignitaries, riots, strikes, presidential summits with five different presidents, conferences involving local, state, and federal entities, etc. 
After retiring, Allen transitioned from the law enforcement instructor side of the Virginia <clears throat> DCJS to the private security instructor side, certified to instruct the following armed and unarmed security officers, alarm respondent, courier, personal protection specialist, private investigator, handgun security officer, handgun, advanced handgun, shotgun patrol rifle, OC spray, and CCW. Wow, what an impressive background. Good morning, Alan, and welcome to the show. Well, it's very honored to be back, Rich. Thank you very much. Well, it's an honor to have you, sir. Um, Michael Gentili says, I spent the first 64 years of my life without knowing I needed to master lapel chokes, and now I'm too old to lapel choke anyone more menacing than the old lady at my church. That's hilarious. Jay says, good morning, gents. He is out there in Hawaii. Good morning, Jay. Coin number 188. Rasmic is on. Good morning, Rasmic. Go ahead and hit that share button. Uh, Alan, I wanted to ask you, you know, this is your second time on Coffee with Rich. I don't know if I remember asking you this last time. What does your impressive bio overlook, sir? Well, um, I enjoy family life. Uh, my wife and I got married in 2009, and we got a second chance at our relationship from years and years ago. So we, we are enjoying life right now as a couple. We've got six grandkids, which that opens up a whole nother keg of nails, if you know what I mean. And the two youngest ones are three years old. So we got our hands full sometimes. They always like to come see Papa and Nene. We like to travel when we get the chance. Um, I'm of the Christian faith and I believe the good Lord. I uh, believe in what he did for us uh, through his son, Jesus Christ. And it wasn't for him a few times in my lifetime career. I may not have been here. If you understand where I'm coming from. I do. Um, I'm involved in some community manners uh, throughout Abingdon and Washington County. So just right now, uh, getting toward the end of my career, we're enjoying things and hopefully in the next three to four years that I shut everything down and it's going to be total retirement at that time. Good. I, you, you certainly deserve it, sir. Got 20 folks on this morning. Let's see. Dave says six grandkids. Hoorah. Mark Hamilton is up there in Toronto, Canada. Good morning. And James is on from West Virginia. I wanted to ask you, what is the, uh, what is the purpose of American law enforcement and kind of give us the current state of things, Alan, as you see it? Well, the, the purpose of law enforcement is to enforce the laws, protect the Constitution, uh, the constitutional rights of individuals out here. The problem we're running into is what you know, came after the George Floyd thing with defund the police and uh, trying to redo all the laws and put new laws in that are tying the hands of law enforcement at this point in time. Give you an example in Virginia, they have made a lot of traffic violations a secondary offense. You cannot pull them over for a primary offense. And they basically did that. And it came out basically saying they did that because you're being racist to use those smaller or not smaller, but those laws just to pull somebody over. And uh, basically because of the color of their skin. Virginia's revamped a lot of the tr uh, equipment laws. Like uh, if you have uh, bald tires. You can't use that as a primary violation. You have to have speeding, reckless driving, driving of the influence to charge that charge, you know, charge of equipment. Registration and inspection stickers in Virginia. You cannot pull the vehicle over until it's three months past expiration. Uh, it's ridiculous on how they've done. How they've, you know, taken the legislature to tie the law enforcement hands. Uh, there's still pockets in the country that want to defund the police. Um, Minnesota with Minneapolis, they are even with the crime rate exploding out there, they are still wanting to revamp the police department in Minneapolis. What's what are they going to call? They're calling a safety patrol or something like that. What, what's the end means to that? So we still got some work, a lot of work to do, but I think there is starting to see a trend that they're realizing this defund of the police is not working out. Numerous cities, numerous states that have 
more or less show social ideas in their legislature or the governors or the far left. They're realizing now that the crime rates rising. If you tie the hands of the police too much, they're not going to be proactive. They're going to go out here and just answer their calls, what they have to do. Plus, they're not having being able to hire and retain law enforcement officers right now. I think the last time I was on here, the state police in Virginia had right at just a little below 300 vacancies. They've gone up almost 340 vacancies, and that's even with a, a 40 um, uh, trooper basic class that just graduated and will get out in the field after they finish their uh, in the field field training officer program. So we're still behind the eight ball. They they can't get the number of applicants. You're scraping the bottom of the barrel to get people to come in and even want to be a law enforcement officer at this time. So, like I said, we're getting a little bit of sense that they're th knowing the steep of the police and they're trying to get some things rectified uh, in some states. Even Senator Cory Booker said, came out and said, oh, we're not going to defund the police. But he was one of the biggest advocates of it in the beginning. So where do you believe and what you don't believe and on, on these issues? We've still got to have uh, people, the public, stand behind us and say, hey, we need something different out here. We need to fund the police, give them the training, give them the equipment that they can operate with instead of throwing them under the bus because we as citizens are getting the bad end of the deal. You know, officers can, you know, are so stretched right now in some of these cities that they can't answer, you know, small crimes. Like if you get a, a trespassing or if you get a bad check in a business or something like this, they're not answering those smaller crime that they call non-influential crimes. They're going just out, they're answering the calls on the big stuff. Yeah, the little, little, the little stuff is what snowballs into the big stuff. That's absolutely right. Uh, absolutely right. Look, we're going to dig into that a little bit, Alan. Uh, Manhar right. is on from South Africa. And, of course, Manhar lives in a country where they did reimagine the police and, and defund the police at, uh, after the, the fall of apartheid in 1994. And that didn't work out too well for them, as uh, Manhar has outlined in the two shows that he and I did together which are outstanding. If you haven't seen those, please go back and watch. Thank you to the 24 folks joining us live. John Hill is on. Good morning, sir. He's from Monroeville, Indiana. Gerald said it would be nice to have a list of all the cities that are defunding the police so we can avoid them for our own safety. I live 100 miles from Portland, Oregon, and have no reason to go there again. Yeah, it's, it's true. Uh, to see, Gerald says, causing chaos to take martial law. Who knows? A conspiracy you know, David uh, Brothers talks about the, uh, the broken window theory. I know Rudy Rudolph Giuliani is in a lot of uh, hot water right now, but he wrote a really good book on leadership. If anyone cares to read it, I, I highly recommend it. And I think David Brothers is the one that recommended I read it. Ed Scarborough was on. Good morning, sir. Coin number 2062. Please hit that share button. One of the things I wanted to ask you was for those that are perhaps younger than you and I, Alan, What's the difference between law enforcement today and, say, in the 70s and 80s? Oh, tremendous amount. Back in the 70s and 80s, we still had our problems with budget cuts, et cetera, but they let us do our job. Uh, you've got to be able to go out here and enforce all the laws. You, be, you know, I don't know the countless number of wanted people that I've pulled over, say, for a headlight out or tag light out or, you know, I usually, I always wrote the violation, but the consequences of that, if they got the violation fixed, came into court, the judge and I had no problem saying that's complied with my law, you know, but look what you can end up with. I've gotten guns, illegal guns. I've gotten one pot uh, meth labs out of vehicles that I've stopped. I've got numerous drug violations and whether you are pro marijuana or anti marijuana, They've relaxed those laws enough that the Virginia State Police have had to retire a whole lot of the canine units because it's more expensive to retrain them to get away from the marijuana ascent 
than it is just to retire him and get another dog and train him just for what he is back here that's available. Well, marijuana has led me to heroin, LSD, uh, methamphetamine. Right before I retired, that's when fentanyl was starting to come in vogue, all those things. And now with that, they're tying our hands. You know, I know it's like drunk driving. You can't drive drunk. A lot of states have open container laws. You know, if you have an open container in there, you're in violation. What about marijuana and some of these other drugs? Uh, e even some of them have gone so far if you have, are starting to, if you have a very small amount of uh, like methamphetamine or some of the harder drugs, they kick you on, write you summons and go on about your business. Uh, you can't have that right now. But back when I first started, we did our job. We enforced the law totally. Uh, if you had marijuana on you, is it, if it's illegal, you got charged with it. Uh, you, you concentrated on what you're doing, and you mentioned Rudy Giuliani. He cut the crime rate in New York City. I can, don't know the exact statistics, but it dropped dramatically because they had things like stop and frisk, take care of the small violations, because a lot of the small violations indicate and lead to bigger violations. Like I said, pull a vehicle over, you know, for tag light, you know, no tags displayed, et cetera, on the uh, expired inspection in Virginia. I got a lot of real good violations and got a lot of people off the street that didn't need to be there because of the, that being able to enforce the law. Now they tied our hands more. You're not being proactive. You're just being, you know, reactive to everything. Now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you look at what uh, Mayor Ed Koch in New York uh, and, and before him, obviously, and David Dinkins, and then you had Ru Rudolph Giuliani to come in there and clean it up. And it's very simple, you know. What he determined was that the same guy that smokes marijuana and jumps a turnstile to, to avoid paying a subway fare is probably the same guy that's already out on warrants or something big. Because I think the um, the mentality before that was, ah, it's a low-level crime. We're going to go look for the, the big fish. Well, the, just think about it. It makes complete sense when you consider it. I know you know this, Alan, but the, the guys that, and gals that commit the small offenses commit the big ones also. And, yeah. uh, and by doing that, and one other thing that he did was pretty amazing for those that have not read the book is now they're arresting everybody. So, and, and the problem becomes how do we funnel them through the system? So they started, as I remember correctly, if I remember correctly, they would have like convert these buses into small uh, arresting stations so they could usher them in, you know, run the checks on them real quick, get them fingerprinted and all this other stuff. So it's, and another thing that the younger generation doesn't remember, Alan, is, in my opinion, they don't remember the condition of New York City in the 70s. I think everyone assumed, and you can see it in, in Hollywood, you know, we had Escape from New York, movies like The Warriors, Fort Apache, The Bronx, Serpico, that graphically illustrated the horrors of New York City. And then fast forward to just a few years ago, it's one of the safest cities in the, in the world. Yeah, and you go back now and go back up there, see the difference that it's reverted back to. Yes. Just give you a prime example by enforcing the law. Uh, it was, I want to say, late, uh, early 2000s, 2001, 2002. I had a vehicle on Interstate 81. You had that deer in the headlight looks looking straight away ahead. Uh, he was running about four to five miles an hour below the speed limit. That was ringing red flags for me. Uh, he did an improper lane change, cut in front of a vehicle, didn't signal, pulled it over. 18 pounds of marijuana came out of the vehicle because the raw marijuana spell hit me in the face about knocking me over. So those are the types of things, you know, that's trafficking. Exactly. You know, that's how you go out here and get the bigger fish, so to speak. But now you probably wouldn't be able to make that stop. No, you can't imagine. do that. No, mm -hmm. you can't. If you roll up on a vehicle now, they roll the window down. 
you can't search the vehicle after you smell marijuana. It's ridiculous. So yeah, and, and you know what's uh, what's unfortunate is our our kids and grandkids are gonna are gonna pay the consequence. They're gonna go have to go through the tough thing of refixing the society again that we're allowing to be destroyed. Yep. Yeah, um, I don't mean um, to be overly dramatic with my language, but I think that I, I don't see anything good coming from this. No, it's not. And you you look at it, it's just like you were exp- ex- describing Giuliani cleaning up New York City. But we're going to revert back to the same type of mentality now with all the laws changing throughout the United States on some of these smaller crimes. It's going to just, it's going to explode and you're already seeing it in some jurisdictions. Absolutely. Guy was on from the Philippines. It says, good morning, Rich. Good morning, Alan. Good morning, my friend. How are y'all doing today? I'm doing better than I deserve. Jason is on this morning from North Central Kansas. Good morning, Jason. Please hit that share button. Thank you to the 21 folks that are still with us this morning and we've got a great show for you. What advice would you give a new law enforcement officer uh, today? Today, who? Yeah. I think long and hard before you even got in the job. I mean, you better have your, like I've said before, you better have your heart into it. It's got to be something that you have a passion for, because if you don't, you're not going to get anywhere in it. Once you get into the job, you're going to have to face ridicule and you're going to have, uh, have constant micromanaging on your back because of all the societal changes that we've had nowadays. Uh, like I said before, you better talk to some of your older officers because that experience is going fast. We're having people retire left and right, and that experience is going to be gone for the uh, newer officers out here. Uh, you're going to have to go through training you never thought about you'd have to go through again. Uh, I call it the touchy-feely training. You know, if you're a good person, it's going to expound in what you do out here in your job. You're not going to treat people unfairly. You're going to be, uh, you know, act in a professional manner, et cetera. If you're not a good person to begin with, then you better not get into this type of job. You better not have a big attitude getting in this type of job, particularly now. Egos have got to go out the door, plain and simple, because first time you get in a situation where they call you everything but an animal, you've got to be th- very thick skinned nowadays. And you've got to know what the law says as far as excessive force. You've got their new laws out here that say you can't do certain restraints. You can't do certain tactics. You've got to know how to handle yourself. and You've got to be ready to do that because it is definitely different when I started in the late 70s. It was hands-on. It's not as hands-on as it is today. We didn't go, and excuse my French, we didn't go out there and beat the hell out of anybody. We did use what force, an equal force against the force we were confronted with to end the threat. And that may include up to and including deadly force. We didn't go out, you know, I've even back then I've had to tell some officers or troopers or other officers and other agencies, that, that's it. We've got him under control. No more, no more. That's the type of uh, attitude that you've got to have. And I, I even had that back. Oh, Back in the day, I've had my share of fights. I've come into the sheriff's office with my uniform half off of me, black eye, you know, bloody nose coming in, dragging the guy in. But I did not beat the hell out of him. I took what force was necessary. He might have been bloodied a little bit, but so was I. So, you know, it boils down to what uh, Andrew uh, Branca says, force upon force has to be equal no more. And so that's what you've got to deal with. And these young officers I hear have got a long road to hoe. I've noticed in the state police academy, we've got, they give them a hell week and it's a very many thing like the SEAL teams go through. They go through with the telephone poles. They get them, you know, about 24 hours a day of, you know, they, they want to weed out those that are not going to be able to handle it in the beginning because they know what these officers and troopers are going to be looking forward in this new time. They're going to have to, they're going to, they're going to have to have the passion for the job. 
and that's about what I can tell them right now because it's definitely changed in the time I went in. Yeah, it has absolutely changed. Uh, you know, T.C. Fuller says, you know, the hickory shampoo, was it a thing in the past? And I remember the defensive tactics instructor in my police academy class talking about how they would r roll their wrist when they hit somebody in the head with a baton to, to, to cut the scalp. And I'm like, uh, it may have been a thing. I don't know, Alan, what do you think? Well, you know, we had the, uh, when I first began, we had the slap sticks, the uh, convoy and the Texan. And you had a little pocket built into your uniform back hip where you carried that. I've used that several times, but I, but what I like to use it for when I had to get up close and personal with somebody, I could have it in my hand and I could whip that thing in their sternum real quick, take the wind out of them, get them under arrest. And that's all the hit that I've had to do a lot of times. So you've got to know how to uh, use your tactics and use them defensively and sometimes offensively to make the rest. If you're out there swinging over like, you know, overhead, back, you know, you know, or have a well, a big first. I got in, introduced in the time when we didn't have the full aluminum flashlights. I had a nine cell re ever ready that had the big head on it, and I warped somebody over the head, and those batteries came out the end of that thing when the head flew off like a machine gun. But uh, that kind of cured me right there on that type of activity. It just, you know, it's not worth it out here. Um, but at the same time. The tactics now have definitely changed and these officers have to abide by the tactics and they have to abide by policy. That gets more officers in trouble by going against policy than it does some other things out here. So I, I tell them, you got to know what your standard operating procedures are and you got to know what's inside that and go by them. It may be even different than what the law is, but you've got to go by that policy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you look back on uh, the Rodney King incident in 1992, yet another uh, infamous incident that, uh, with Malice Green up in Detroit. Uh, not many people remember that, but I think it was about, yeah, almost 30 years ago. And the two officers were indicted. And I want to say that um, I'd have to go back and refresh myself. They struck him in the head with a mag light and he ended up dying. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it's similar to the Mr. George Floyd situation. Um, Malice Green had a, a, a potentially lethal cocktail in his system of drugs as he was leaving a drug house, if I remember correctly. And uh, this gentleman had the hardening of the arteries, the autopsy found, if I remember correctly. But again, the cops did strike him in the head with a baton as they were fighting him. Head, you know, head wounds obviously bleed a lot. And it, what does it look like? The optics of it is horrible. You have two white officers a bloody suspect who's now dead mm -hmm. and they went to prison you know, for probably the rest of their lives. So we do need to be smarter with how we train officers. We do need to be better with the defensive tactics, but my concern with what's going on in New York on limiting the amount, uh, uh, you know, limiting certain types of holds, certain types of arrest positions for their officers. My concern, Alan, is that officers are going to be quicker to go to the belt and some of the other tools because they've taken away the ability to use my body weight on the suspect uh, to, to put him in a prone position and uh, arrest him. What are your thoughts on that? Exactly. I don't know how many times that I've had to, you know, when, when, you, when it got hands-on, sometimes you have no choice but going hands-on. But I have gotten somebody from behind the back, wrapped around, got them, you know, under the neck, swept their feet out from under them, take them down and me get on top of them. Once I get them down, then I start controlling the arms and getting, get them the handcuff. Sometimes that's the only way that you can get them cuffed. If you get somebody that doesn't want to be cuffed, you maybe most of the time an individual officer is not going to get that subject cuffed. So what else are you supposed to do? I mean, you've got to get them in certain types of holds. You've got to, you know, do what you have to get them handcuffed and get them secured. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, like I, my favorite thing. It's a catch twenty two situation. Sometimes it's about damned if you do and damned if you don't. And so, uh, good boils down what I've told other people, and I wished I had done more of this when I was in my career. I always tried to do extra firearms training, extra tactics, but I would always say. 
go out here and get involved with some uh, defensive tactics that has background in jujitsu or some some of these grappling type uh, really or whatever you you know the grappling type uh, arts yeah. arts yes thank yeah. you sir that would help you take these subjects under control because you're not going to be able to use the you know, baton. They, they've quit issuing the, you know, slap sticks and all that. You're not going to be able to use striking as your best friend. And in fact, I would not suggest striking anybody unless it's a life or death, death situation. So I would suggest law enforcement, you're not going to get it in your academies like a lot of people would like for you to, but at least get involved in it. Get, you know, enough to get some real good basics to where you can handle yourself at. Well, yeah, and my, my jiu-jitsu coach, Cody Hudson, uh, he, he runs a law enforcement-only clinic on Monday nights, and I mm -hmm. want to say it's free. Uh, they have, There's a program I think Gracie Baja has for Adopt-A-Cop, adopt, a, adopt a cop. Mm -hmm. and if you're a law enforcement officer that's watching this or listening to it on the podcast, find out if your local BJJ dojo has that for you. Let's get to some of the questions here, Alan. Mark says, good morning, Rich and Alan. Dave's brother says, are more advanced non-lethals or more surveillance and mitigation? What do you think, Alan? Uh, more advanced uh, non-lethals, is that what you said? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, they're very viable, and we're going to have to rely on them a lot more. Uh, OC, uh, tasers, and tasers have their pros and cons. The problem with a taser, when they go down, they go down hard, so you got to worry about that. Um, you've got beanbag ammunition, you've got rubber bullets, these type of things to handle certain large, you know, large crowds, but your non-lethals are going to be involved in more soft and hard techniques, um, grappling, takedowns, holds, you're going to be uh, getting into more grappling type situations. Um, you've got to watch how you use some of these you know, harder strikes, uh, using fists, using uh, uh, any implement that would strike anybody, like a flashlight, these things. Um, you're going to see a lot more emphasis on non-lethal stuff here in the, if it's not beginning now, particularly in the future. Yeah, I completely agree with that. John Hill says, should law enforcement be offered in vocational schools like a general trade, engage young men and women? then offer apprenticeships with local agencies. I think some, some communities do that with their Explorer programs, right? Yes, uh, we did have an Explorer program in this area down here in Southwest Virginia. And then when I hired, got hired by the state police, the, the only other one I thought think was in Roanoke area. That is a good start, but you gotta be very careful on how you utilize those people in the beginning you just can't throw them a lot and this has happened several times you throw an explorer on a ride-along program and then the stuff hits the fan you know the officer's not only got to worry about his threat but he's got to worry about protecting the person there um if you use the explorer program correctly or something like that or get into a like a lot of uh, police departments have a civilian police academy um, that might be viable options, but you got to be very careful on how you utilize those situations with the, you know, the situations you may get into, you know, out here on the job. So I'm just concerned that we may take that too far. A vocational type school, uh, I would almost say you'd have to have it in conjunction with a law enforcement uh, credit academy to do that or put it under like an associate's degree program for the educational purposes. I may be wrong on that, but I'm really concerned about the liability situations you could run into. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's the truth, man. Don't throw those guys to the wolves. Uh, we had a program similar to that in the Marine Corps reserves and uh, you put those guys in a uniform. They haven't been to boot camp yet. And a lot of people forget this guy's not a Marine. He's waiting to go to boot camp, but we put him in a uniform and let him come to the drill weekends. And and next thing you know, it's like this guy's throwing grenades and shooting around, live rounds. And it's like, wait a minute, this this young man is he's just somebody off the street. And a case in point of that is we had happen here in um, East Tennessee, where I live, about 25 miles from my home. There was a uh, 
uh, Deputy Bill Jones, and uh, he had a ride along that day, Mike Brown, and they were going to arrest the Houston brothers. And they made an, uh, one of the, I don't know if it was the officer or the ride along, made an off color remark at a convenience store saying, Yeah, we're going to go get these fellas and uh, they, they're going to get what's coming to them. And the, one of the people at the convenience store that overheard it called ahead to the Houston brothers, and the Houston brothers ambushed and killed both of them. And the interesting thing about it, uh, Alan, is uh, I, the Houston brothers didn't go to prison for it because they, they, uh, their lawyer presented that there was a malice of forethought and maybe they were coming to kill them. So yeah, that, believe it that, or not, they got off. That will, and I can see that happening. You know, that's that's a situation you run into. Uh, I can remember the day uh, right before I was about to get hired with the uh, Washington County Sheriff's Department. The Washington County Sheriff's Department had a ride-along program. And citizens could ride along with a deputy. Well, uh, about that time, there was another instance, I want to say down in Georgia, they had the same thing with a citizen out there caused almost a full-scale riot because he made a lot of comments and he was, you know, had that thumping chest idea. He thought he was riding around with a cop and was a cop, but he's not. So that program got shut down real quick with the uh, sheriff's department. So what they did, they started an auxiliary program. And that helped in some ways because the auxiliary officers didn't go through a full academy, but they went through a lot of things, uh, policy, law. They had to be proficient with a firearm. They had to go through some defensive tactics. And what it actually gave, like on high uh, frequency crime days, like on the weekends, it gave another officer out there to help a deputy. So or another person to help a deputy. And they were actually sworn auxiliary officers. And a lot of agencies utilize that because they at least have some, maybe not the full academy type training, but they have some training out here to where they can make decisions only under the decision of the officer they're with. So I could I could see that working out in some ways too. Absolutely. Uh, William is on. He says I started as an explorer in Texarkana. Well, wow, that's awesome, man. Right. Yeah, that that is awesome. Uh, Alan, one of the things that I, I've always admired about you, you you have a great amount of instructor credentials and time under your belt as an instructor. And I wanted to ask you, sir, what in your opinion, what makes a great instructor? Uh, what makes a great instructor? Um, you have to have a passion for it. Uh, if you don't have go out here and have a passion for the instructing, what I call the instructing idea is you've got to be able to want to teach people and see how they progress and how you do that. Um, you've got to know contextual content of the, the subject matters that you're instructing. Uh, that is, you've got to go out here and know what are you trying to teach this person? Are there skills? Are they, uh, you know, in intellectual ideas that you need to get across to them? The contextual part of it has to be something you recognize. Then you have to develop the content. And when you develop that content, you've got to do it in certain ways that is relatable to that person you're trying to teach. You've got to have a lot of patience. That's one thing because you have some people out here that can apply things mechanically, but like some people can't take tests, you know, but you've got to be able to get that information using the context of what you're doing. It's just like firearms. The context of this uh, part of the firearms thing is the proper grip. You've got to be able to show them the proper grip. You've got to be able to show them why that grip is important. You've got to show them that if you have uh, the grips not, you know, proper, what it can do to the firearm, what it can do for your accuracy. All these things are the contextual part of it. But then you have to develop that, like I said, that content to be able to relate that. You've got to physically go out here and demonstrate not just dry fire demonstrate, but you've also got to go out here on the range and demonstrate the procedures about the draw, the grip, the stance, all this stuff to where they can see 
what is applicable and what's not applicable to be able to get it into their, well, it's kind of like some of the books I've read, the instructional part of it. What does it take to teach? And what does it take, what, how the human learns things? Well, you've got to go be able to get that and you've got to do it in such a way that, that the, the, the person is able to grasp the contextual part of it and use your content to relay that contextual part of it over to putting it apical in what they're doing. Um, I have found I've had to work with people, you know, this last group of people, uh, people I had in a basic class for the hospital entity that I work for down here. He was anticipating the shop and I almost had to spoon feed him, get behind him, you know, take a deep breath, you know, settle down, press the trigger all the way through, make it a surprise, so to speak. When I would do that, he'd hit an X-ring. If I didn't do that, he'd get up there, he'd get hyperventilating. When he put that finger on the trigger, it uh, you could see the muscles tension up as that trigger was going back, anticipating that shot, and it'd go all over the place. I worked, I worked, I worked, you know, putting my hands over his hands on the grip, pulling the trigger for him, what he needed to feel. Finally, the light went on. And so you have to have that patience out here to be able to work with these people. Eventually, they can absorb the content that they're getting and the contextual part of it. The light comes on, if you understand what I'm talking about. you got to have all these things. You've got to do it. You've got to develop your um, class outlines step by step by step by step. And you not only have to do that in the classroom, but you have to be able to form and demonstrate in the fields and not just dry fire. You've got to actual, actually fire rounds. Or if you're teaching a class about armed security, you've got to go in there and tell them what's your main purpose. The context of the armed security is to observe, detect, and report. And you keep reiterating that through the class and, and applying it to the laws, to the policies, et cetera. That's, it's a big format that you have to have out here. And if you don't have the passion to do this, you're going to halfway train your people. Well, well said, sir. And I want to really double down on one of the things you talked about, Alan, that is the contextual piece. Uh, I, I see well-intentioned instructors providing information with little to no context to it or incorrect context. And it's one of the things that Mike and I really uh, make sure to hammer home in our instructor development courses. And I think that if you don't establish context at the beginning, then you could really let some people misunderstand. And the other thing is, I, I, I think uh, uh, instructors mean well when they, when they give the student these never and all, never and always statements, you know, never do this or always do that. Like, well, I don't think it's, I don't think you can ever do that because I'll give you an example. We see this, uh, this was really in vogue, as you may remember, Alan, in the uh, years ago, not too long ago, where every single time you did a mag change, you'd have the, uh, the law enforcement officer would take this big step offline, right? I mean, everybody was doing it every, everywhere we would go. And it's like, okay, why are you doing that? Understand why you're doing that? Well, I might want to, get behind cover or I, I, I'm going to let the, uh, the offender is going to lose sight of me when I move, when you move that much, he's, he suddenly can't see you. Or what if you're standing, what if you're firing from behind cover, like you should be, and you've got this rote memorization that you're going to step. Now you're going to step out from behind cover, or maybe you're going to step in front of somebody's muzzle. So again, it's like contextually, why are you doing that? Explain to me why. And if you can't, then maybe we need to reevaluate. Are you, would you agree with that or am I off base? No, you're not off base because you've got to be able to, the, when you're using context, you're building, you're, you're kind of putting your program out here. This is what we need you to do. This is why we're telling you to do this. This is why it's beneficial for you. All that context, and you got to be able to relay that to that person. Because while you're doing this, and then when you get into the content of it, you're building that person's muscle memory. You're building that ingrained training that they're going to react under stress just exactly how they're doing it. And if you don't do that correctly, 
what's going to happen out here when they do get in a situation, as I say, the stuff hits the fan, what are they going to do? So you've got to be able to relay that, relay that to them. And if you, the contextual part of it has to be laid out in the very beginning, you know, yeah. it's just, yeah. this, you know, mag changes, you know, that I had to get a lot of people out of that on mag changes. You're not going to do that step. When the stuff hits the fan, you need to be able to get that. If it's an emergency reload, it's locked back. Dump that magazine. Don't worry about that magazine. Get that gun back in the fight and do your fighting. You know, you know that's what you got to do. If you don't get that context now, if you're taught tell them to dance around out here, then that's exactly what they're going to do out here on, on you know in the situation. Decision making is the same way. If you don't have the contextual thing and all the uh, subjects you do you you teach about how to react, how to handle personnel, how to be able to talk to people, all those things. If you don't get that established, then they're not, they're not going to be able to do it out here on the job and be able to do it successfully. So I agree with you a thousand percent on that. Yeah. I'll give one more thing on context. And I'm going to talk to the point that you made uh, about the written, written tests. So when we had warrior camp a couple of years ago, we had a, uh, Dr. Fuller was there, and so was uh, Attorney Andrew Branca, and he puts on his one-day legal seminar. And, and at, at the end of the, the day, to put the five elements of, of the laws of self-defense into context, we put the students that wish to go through it through the simulator. Mm -hmm. And they can actually apply the five elements of the law of self-defense in context in front of their peers. And then Dr. Fuller, as a retired FBI agent, would have them face about and he would interrogate them as would an investigator in a post-incident shooting. And everybody gets to see how it goes down. And uh, it, it's such an eye opener for people that have never been through that training before. Of course, you've been through that training a lot as, as have I and many people that are watching this morning are current former law enforcement or military guys and gals. But for the average citizen that carries a gun, I don't think they are they have been through that kind of level of training. And I would tell you, seek that level of training out because it will pay dividends if you are going to be an armed defender. Would you, would you agree? Oh yes. Oh yes. Um, I teach concealed carry classes. State of Virginia uh, used to be able to take it online, but all you have to do is do an eight hour course. And my course goes a little bit further than that. We go over all the, necessary laws we go over how to dress how to you know present yourself out here in public all these things but then we have to go to the range because i want to be able to if i put my name on that line that i've taught you this course i want to be able to know that you've had a have an inkling of how to handle a firearm and if you don't handle that firearm to what i feel like is at least an entry level necessity my name does not go on it and you do not get the certificate to go get your concealed weapon from me. So, and I always encourage people, I, I do advanced classes and the advanced classes are like one day. It's a lot of times on the weekend in the fall one day for about three to four weeks, we go through and go through more, a little bit more advanced training, um, particularly, what happens inside your home because you're not necessarily always going to be out in the public, you know, well, how to respond to the, what goes bump in the night. How many people have shot a family member, et cetera. Also on the concealed part, carry part of it. Do you want to get involved in every incident or do you want to be a very good witness? You know, there's times you've got to make these decision-making processes. And if you're not that capable of making those decision uh, processes, you have no, and people may say, well, that's kind of and a gun. Well, you have no business carrying a gun uh, concealed in public unless you have gone through something to be able to rely on, again, the contextual part, contextual part of it. Why do I need a gun? Why do I, you know, if I'm concealed carry, why, when, where, and how I should, you know, approach a situation? Like I said, most of the time, you may just want to be a good witness. Uh, this, you know, I don't know if that's what your line of thinking is, but that's the way I feel about it. And I'm not putting my name on a certificate unless I feel like it is legitimately earned, if you understand where I'm coming from. I do. And in defense of third party, you know, uh, 
can be a very sticky legal problem. And a matter of fact, in two states, it's not recognized at all as grounds right. for self-defense. So that that can get you in a lot of trouble. Let's talk about the the uh, you mentioned it briefly, Alan, and that is the written portion. And I don't include that or Mike, I shouldn't say includes. We don't include written examinations. And it really came down to one thing. We taught a close quarters battle class to a SWAT team. This is probably 20 years ago. And um, one of the captains in the class is a former Army Ranger, an amazingly talented shooter, tactician, et cetera. Was by far and away the best student we had in the class. And at the end of it, we gave him the written exam and he failed it. Mm -hmm. Gave it to him, a version of it again, and he failed it. And as soon as I told him we were going to be taking a written test, and it was a very, very easy test, I could see him start to sweat. And I literally, visually, and then, of course, he failed it, and he failed it the second time. So we took him in a side room because I'm like, I don't, I don't, I can't fail this guy. He performed everything flawlessly, but for some reason cannot pass some sort of written test. It just was, it blew my mind. And we took him into a room and asked him the question, looked at him, and just have him tell us, don't write it down, just tell us the answer. And, of course, he knew it all, but there was some sort of mental block there. So, uh, you know, we decided – are you going to take a written test when you conduct close quarters battle? Or are you going to do CQB inside of a room? Right. So it's like, what, what are we, what are we doing? Right. Um, yeah. I wouldn't, I don't like test either, but I'm mandated by the state of Virginia yes. through the department of criminal justice system. But I have to give tests. And, uh, but when it comes to the practicality of firearms, uh, self-defensive tactics, you know, like handcuffing techniques and like that. I'd much rather have a person be out here to perform those things and perform them properly than me sat down and put a written test. What's the flutes on a revolver for, et cetera, you know, stuff like that. Um, even one of the test questions is a, a dud is a supervisor that doesn't do his job correctly. That's asinine. You know where I'm coming from. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go, uh, go out here, make them perform the practical things, and you can ask questions through this practical and determine if they know what the, you know, like we say, the context of what they've been taught. Give me that information, and then I know, along with your performance and your verbal communications with me, that you are capable of doing that particular practical. So I'd much rather have that, but I mandated uh, out here. I don't give a written test on my concealed carry classes. Uh, they have to perform for me. And once I can get see their performance, whether I'm going to sign on the dotted line. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Fuller says, it's a good point you make, sir. I think it's safe to say we all support the right to own and carry a firearm. We may or may not support some people's choice to own and carry. It's subtle, but a critical point that often gets lost in the shuffle. Well said. Jason says, all the time you should want to be a great witness. Use the mantra of run, hide, fight. Even if armed, you can get away, get away. If you can't, find cover and hunker down. If trouble comes your way, handle it. Yeah, the interesting thing Jason makes there, and it, it's true, but it's also I don't disagree with anything you said. The run, hide, fight, I think is really good, but it doesn't have to be in that order. If the guy's standing in front of me, it may be fight. And I'll give you an example. I was looking at the details of the Aurora shooting where that uh, maniac went into the uh, movie theater and started killing people. And if you look at the computer models that they did uh, showing the relative position of the perpetrator as he moved across the front, there were people that, and, I, and again, I'm not armchair quarterback and anybody but if you look where he was he bypassed some people and as he's reloading and struggling with that ar-15 because it kept jamming on him someone could have taken it taken the fight to him right then had they known what to be looking for so exactly. again uh in, in that case there was nowhere to run to there was no place to hide there was no ballistic cover in that movie theater so the best might have been fight especially if he was in arm's reach and struggling with an ar what do you think Exactly. You, those are the decision making processes that you can build in your training to get them to react under situations like that, using simunitions, using uh, 
uh, training guns, you know, the blue and red training guns, stuff like that. Put them through some practicals that are real life. We, I do that a lot. And um, it's a real eye opener for some people. And, uh, you know, it boils down to, like I said, sometimes it be a good witness, but you, that decision-making process may be prevented, uh, presented to you, but you've got to react to protect yourself or a family member. So you may have to go hands-on or you may have to use up to and including deadly force to get, get the threat to stop. So, yes, I, I'm in total agreement with that. Yeah. Tony says not being able to take a written test is probably a result of some type of neurological trauma from earlier in life, or as Dan points out, it could be as simple as being dyslexic. Obviously it doesn't impair his cognitive ability. Yeah, it certainly didn't. Jason says exactly. They are not linear. He's referring to the run hot fight, except fighting. Once people go kinetic, finish the fight. Yeah, totally exactly. agree with that. Absolutely. Dave brother says operators are athletes, not academics. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, <laughs> What advice would you give someone that wants to be a new instructor? And the reason I ask this is uh, Jesse is often on here and Jesse attended our training recently up in Michigan. He wants to be a new firearms instructor. So just in case Jesse is watching this later, Alan, what advice would you give someone like him that's new to being a firearms instructor? Well, uh, one thing I would tell people, you can't be, you know, if you have a class of from say three up to 30, You've got to be able to get in front of them to speak. I would tell people, take a public speaking class. I mean, you get up there, if you can't relay your information, you get tongue tied. Well, I get tongue tied anyway at times. But if you get up there and you can't relay the information and you get confused, you've got to be able to use your program material. But also, you've got to get up there and teach not directly from a book. So I would tell people to go take a public speaking class, at least for that end of it. Also, you have to have the passion for what you're doing. Okay. Uh, I'm not a, a number one, super competitive, big shot shooter, but you've got to be able to go out here, at least hit the target to demonstrate what you're doing. Okay. Uh, go take your firearms classes. Uh, there are courses online that you can take that shows you how to, uh, uh, organize and present material that you may have to, uh, teach and that gets the organizational part of it is, is something you need to be aware of. You got to take steps, step A, B, C, D, E. So make sure your organizational stuff in your outline, you don't want to bounce around, you know, you don't want to go to Tay to, uh, emergency mag uh, change before you start out the basics on how to draw the firearm. So you've got to do it like that. Um, go watch other instructors and that's getting involved in other classes out here. Watch other instructors out here. Presentation, practical presentation is very important. You know, you have to get the, you know, what I usually do when we go into the grip, uh, I have everybody come out of the, you know, with safe firearms, come out, show them that grip and go to each one of them and just their grip, you know, uh, be able to relay and talk to these people. So if you can't relay that and you can't get the contextual part of it out there to where your content takes over to be able to train them, um, you got to know, know all that. So the, those, uh, the biggest thing is the passion for it. You got to have a passion to teach. When I know I'm out here teaching, whether it be an unarmed security officer class or a firearms class or a concealed carry class, when you see people body language change, when they, they grasp the idea that you are trying to present to them, you have taught them something. Then. So all those things together, and I may be way off base on some of the things that you may think about, but these are some of the things that you've got to be able to do. And I would suggest, you know, take a couple of firearms classes, you know, go out here, practice what you are getting ready to teach. Now I'm getting ready to next week. I'm going to have a full next two weeks of teaching. I haven't put my duty belt on for about a, three weeks now because I'm going to be teaching some of the classes 
the duty belt. I've got to gear up. I'm going to go out here sometime today or tomorrow, and I'm going to throw my duty belt on there, and I'm going to do 50 to 100 reps of activating my Safari Land Level 3 holster and coming out drawing on target. Just as so though I can be refreshed, I get in class, I don't look like an idiot. Okay? So these things, be prepared. Make sure you practice what you're getting ready to keep. Get your, all your materials ready. Get your forms ready. Come into class, and that shows at least the people in the beginning you know what you're doing. Okay? So, there's a whole lot of things. That's just it in a nutshell what I can do. Yeah, I want to I want to touch on one of the things that you mentioned, Alan, as far as being an instructor, being able to demonstrate the skills and abilities that you want the student to do. I think that the student has a right to expect performance on demand from their instructor. And I'm not saying that you have to be Mike Seekland or Rob Latham fast or run a gun like Jerry Mitchlick or Eric or fail or anybody like that. But what I think the reason that you should demonstrate as an instructor is, is probably one of the, the most amazing neuroscience discoveries in the last decade or so. And that is the idea of, or the reality of mirror neurons that we have in our brains and mirror neurons are actually firing when they're watching. If they're performing the skill, they're firing. If they're watching an instructor perform the skill, they're also firing. So and we need to understand that and use it to our advantage as instructors. And if you demonstrate it perfectly, didn't say demonstrate it lightning fast. Matter of fact, you shouldn't because then no. the student doesn't know what happened. Uh, but you need to demonstrate it correctly. Would you agree, sir? Oh, yes. One of the things that I expound on very much is malfunction drills. And to go out here and the thing I do, even in the class, we'll make them do faux malfunction drills just to get them handling the firearm without ammunition okay we do it safely unload it we check double check triple check then we go out on the range then i get in there and i will demonstrate them step by step you know tap so you got a double feed tap it rack it nothing happens then i get in there and i show them the slow part tap you know, rack, nothing happens. I do that step by step. Then I go into where I strip the magazine off. The position where I put the magazine in my, you know, little finger holding on the gun because I've got, to, I keep the magazine and gun together. They don't go flying everywhere. Rack the slide, you know, get the round out. Then reinsert, tap, rack, and, you know, how you pick up the magazine from over here, how you insert it. We do that step by step several ways. I do that with non-live ammunition at that time. Then I go, I load up, and I present the double feed in my firearm. I go through, I do it slowly, then I go through it a couple more times, a little bit faster each time, so they get the information they need uh, to be able to perform that. Then we go step by step with the students. So, you know, you've got to be able to do that on all your things that demonstrate and you got to do it with live fire so they know it can work. And if you don't do it like that, you are not helping the student out at all. You're muted. That's one of the things I love to do, Alan, is mute. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I stay away from that. <laughs> yeah. You'll think I'll learn one day, but I haven't so far. Jesse is on. Jesse, I just asked Alan Kelly a, a question that I think uh, might be pertaining to you as far as being a new instructor. So make sure you go back and watch that. Was that uh, was that up to your what you were, you know, that's how I review it. And I don't know if it was out of line or not. So, yeah, we we one of the things that sound like you're discussing is said that we you know static, fluid and dynamic levels of training, you know, static. Right. Um, we're walking through by the numbers on the instructor prompts and then so on and so on as crawl, walk, run, whatever euphemism. Yeah. That's with. basically what crawl, walk, run. Yes. Mm -hmm. Jeff asked a good question though. He says, as an instructor, uh, how do you deal with the gun guy in the class? You know, that's uh, trying to enter his comments every 15 seconds. How do you deal with that guy? Uh, well, I try to do it as diplomatically as I can, but some of them are hard headed enough. You, do, uh, I've had to come up and say, when you can perform this the way I want you to perform it, 
then we'll look at your way. But right now, this is the way I'm having to teach it by policy, the way I'm having to teach it, be able to get everybody on the same sheet of music. You know, I have to go in and explain to them why I'm doing what I'm doing. So, you know, and it kind of shuts them down right there. Uh, some comments I'll overlook, but if it gets to where it's interrupting the whole time, then I will have to talk to them and just say, hey, this is why I'm teaching it this way. Then after we get through, if you want to try your way and see whose way is better. I'm not perfect. Your way may be better, but we're going to do it my way right now. Plain and simple. Yeah, I like that. Watching the events that are unfolding, we're going to shift gears a little bit, Alan. And I, I know that uh, you might not be a foreign policy expert, but uh, you know your your credentials as an American are without question. As as you watch what's un unfolding currently in Afghanistan, here we are on August the twentieth, and it's just been a debacle for at least one one week running now. What what thoughts come to mind, and what are the long term implications of what you're seeing there? Huh. I think I've posted some things on Facebook that um, I think what's gone on at this point in time, and I know I'm probably going to get a lot of feedback for this, but this is my opinion, my opinion. Only. I think what's happened out here has shown what this administration is calorie, calorie, calorie incompetent and has no idea how to handle a situation whatsoever. Uh, they're trying to blame this, this, this. They've got their uh, internal people with the State Department, all this, blaming this, this, and this. They were trying to make a point to be the one that got everybody out of Afghanistan. They didn't have a plan. Uh, from what I understand, the last administration, it was going to determine what the crisis and what the situation was at the time, how it was going to be handled to get out of there. They all of a sudden just said, this is going to happen. Bang, we're out of there. No contingency plans. And the thing that gripes me the most out of this whole situation is two things. Number one, why are we not getting the American citizens out of there right now first and had them out here? make contact with those people, get them to the airport, airport, give them safe passage to the airport and get our United States citizens out of there first. Then we start slowly pulling our military out and bringing our equipment out, the military vehicles, the sensitive material equipment out of here. Take it all. They were warned in the very beginning, back a year ago, that when this was going to be pulled out, that this is probably what was going to happen, was the, for, uh, the forces were there, the Afghan forces were not going to be able to handle it and would let a walk through with the Taliban. They have weakened this country. You already have the drums beating from China from North Korea, Russia, and a few other countries saying, ooh, we've got an opening here. Maybe we need to test the waters. And what I'm hoping will happen is all of them to don't test the waters at the same time. Because our military leaders, and I know you're, you're I'm not, I haven't been in the military, but I feel like our military leaders were as much fault of this in some ways as the current administration. I'm sorry. The only positive thing, and not just because you're a Marine, the Marine Commandant sent out a letter, and that was a real, real decent letter. He was backing his people. I don't see the others getting backed out here. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm way off base. But this is not what the United States is about. You understand? We, we should have had... All the U.S. citizens, contractors, teachers, there's even a doctor, a local doctor that's down there that can't make it to the airport. And he, he's wanting to get out. What has happened there? Oh, they're, they came up and say, we had it under control. We did all this stuff. They still haven't got it under control. 
No, and I, I, I read an article the other day. It says uh, in Wednesday advisory, the U.S. Embassy in Kabul said, quote, the United States government cannot ensure safe passage to the Hamid Karzai International Airport, end quote. Rather than having U.S. forces retrieve Americans, the U.S. State Department is relying on the assurances of the Taliban that they will let the Americans through. And on Wednesday of this week, the State Department, this is a quote, the State Department is working with the Taliban to facilitate safe passage of American citizens and U.S. passport holders. And that's a quote from uh, General uh, Milley, who's the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I find that grotesque and sickening because we're not talking about a foreign government. We're talking about a terrorist organization. And we're we're going to rely upon them to give our citizens safe passage. And what if they don't? Uh, what are we prepared to do? Yeah, exactly. What are we prepared to do? We should have been in there to prepare to begin with. They knew they wanted to get out of there. And I'm saying we've been in Afghanistan long enough. Yeah. If they can't handle their self, let them go over and kill each other. I'm sorry. That's the way it should be. That's what civil wars do. But get our people, our equipment out of there first. Then we come out slowly, progressively coming out and covering our troops the best we can and get out of there. I mean, that's common sense. I was old enough to know, watch the fall of Saigon, you know, and I'm looking, and when the, when I saw those images on TV, the hair stood out on my, the back of my neck. You know, what are, you know, and then they come up and say, well, we, just like you said, they can't uh, offer safe passage and they're relying on the Taliban the Taliban said they'll let females uh, continue on and have the rights. They've already had instances that have been documented. They've killed, for the very first day, they killed one woman that didn't have a burqa on. So is that, are we going to rely on their word? And what if they don't live up to it? Yeah, <laughs> what exactly. We, yeah. What's going to happen? Are we going to have American citizens over there that are probably eventually going to be killed i mean that's their bylaw look at the look on you know the taliban isis and uh, uh jihadists over there look how many televised beheadings they did come on people give me a break in the uh, government you know yeah, yeah it's i a just mess. I, I, I i'm i get on my soapbox and sometimes i can't shut up and i'm having to bite my lower lip because there's a lot more I would like to say that you probably shut me off. So that's where I stand. It's <laughs> going you. long. And you ask about long-term consequences. Yeah, let's we talk have about yet that. to see what the long-term consequences are. Well, President Yi has already come out and uh, started rattling the saber a little bit with regard to mm -hmm. Taiwan and what China is willing to do. And, and they see uh, the weakness that we've, that we've uh, shown here mm -hmm. with the handling of this Afghan, Afghanistan situation. Uh, Tony has a great question. He says, who has vetted those 800 souls brought out by that C-17? I would venture a guess no one has. Mm -mm. And, and what have we just allowed into our country or wherever they're being held at this moment? John oh. is on. John, uh, coin number 200, I'm sorry, 2,230. And John, thank you for being on this morning. It was great seeing you last night in the Zoom session. And I want to take a, a brief second to talk about that. If you remember the American Warrior Society, uh, you can join Mike Seeklander and I Thursday nights on our Zoom coaching session. And if there's any questions that you have, uh, you'll get it straight from the horse's mouth right there. Dave Brothers says the Taliban still has a presence on social media. And he's right. Let that sink in for a second, folks. The Taliban is on Twitter, but former president, the 45th president of the United States of America is not. And if that doesn't uh, cause you a problem, uh, then I don't know what to tell you because... We have silenced the 45th president of the United States, whether you like him or not. Uh, they have cut him off, but the Taliban leadership is still alive and well on Twitter and other social media sites. That just shows you how this country has turned in some ways. Um, you know, we have a First Amendment right out here. You know, it is not exclusive for everything, but we have a First Amendment right. I respect you and what you say. You should respect me and what I say, unless it turns violent or racist or something like that. 
we have that First Amendment right. And what they are truly doing on that, they're promoting terrorism by letting them on here and not letting a ex-president, former president, to have his opinion because they don't like his opinion or they don't like him. There's a lot of people out here I don't like, but I'm not going to uh, silence them. They have that right to say what they say. A lot of people don't like me. Hey, I've been called worse. You understand where I'm coming from? We have that First Amendment right. You're muted. Of course I'm muted. It's one of the things <laughs> I do, Alan. Hey, I was going to say is uh, First Amendment rights pertain to American citizens. It doesn't necessarily pertain to the Taliban. We can and should, and as well as uh, companies. They, they can do as they wish with their platform, but you know, it just, I, I, I don't, I don't understand it anyway. And I think that another thing is how can you test the strength of the first amendment is to let people say things that you don't like. And I've, I've, I've said this so many times before, do I like the Colin Kaepernick kneeling for the, um, uh, the national anthem? It, it boils my blood, but at the same time, I spent 23 years in uniform to give him the right to do that stupid, misguided uh, act that he's doing. And I believe my a lot of my friends died for his right to be a, a, a moron on national television. I don't want to. I mean, that that's a that's a right. He's not hurting anybody. Let him do it. And and let's we'll see if he gets a job or whatever. <laughs> but uh, Gerald says, here we are on Facebook. How else can we stay connected? That's a great question. And I don't know if the, you know, what the right answer is. Look, I mean, look what happened. They tried to do was it, was a parlor mm -hmm. and they shut it down. And, and I, I would venture a guess that with the monopoly that is going on right now with these social media companies, they're going to shut down anything else that wants to allow free speech. It is as Jeff points out, it's pure insanity. So yeah, the long-term implications of what's going on, I think we're, we're yet to see. And one of the, one of the, one of the things you mentioned, the fall of Saigon, I too remember that. I think I was in like kindergarten or first grade, and I just remember all the adults really being upset, and the images that were on the TV were, were pretty shocking to me, watching helicopters get pushed off of aircraft carriers and things of this nature. But I think what's going on in Afghanistan is worse. And the reason I say that is, at least when the North, Viet North Vietnam was taken over, it was a legitimate country. You could, they weren't terrorists. Mm -hmm. it, it was a nation state that was recognized by the international community. The Taliban is not. Are they, uh, you know, they're, I don't know if they're uh, labeled a terrorist by the FBI or the DOJ. I'm, I'm assuming they are. I'd have to look at that. But we're not handing over Afghanistan to a country or a form of government. We're handing it over to warlords, basically, or terrorists at worst. What do you think? Am I right? Yeah, you're right. Um, I, you know, those, this is one of those things I don't know what the correct answer is. Um, I'm not a, you know, I'm just a regular old citizen out here, but uh, I think we've, you know, we've got to be able to, when we go into a conflict, we've got to be able to go into a conflict with the idea to win it or at least end it, you know, whatever we do. If we've got to do what we're doing now, you've got to have some type of plan to take care of it. I, I you know, I saw Saigon when I was a, in 73, I graduated from high school. So I watched that, you know, uh, it became, uh, became an image that I did not like. Uh, we've, we, I don't know. I'm kind of at a loss of words on some things like this. I'm not an expert, but at the same time, I think things could have been handled a whole lot differently and they weren't. And now we've got, we've got situations that could blow up, you know, and it, and it not just this, it's the economic situations. The other things are going on with this country along with this is causing us to look weaker and weaker and weaker to the whole country. So I think it's going, it's a, it's a situation that's going to blow up. And I don't know if we've got the people capable in their in the administration to handle it right now. In fact, I know they can't handle it if they can't handle this. Yeah. 
Thank you to the 26 folks that are still with us. And uh, thank you, Alan, for being on. We've been on for almost an hour and a half. It's been an amazing show. As Matt Sims points out, says, good job, guys. May God bless America. Guile in the Philippines says the Taliban said they will not harm anybody. They want a peaceful transition. I don't believe them. And that that's the that brings us back to your point. Like you and I are not foreign policy experts, but we do know a little bit about uh, conflict management. And one of the things I would say is I forget someone that said this. It might have been Tom Givens. But the idea that you're going to surrender your choice over to the person that's robbing you at gunpoint. And I, the reason I say that is because it's the same thing with the Taliban. You're going to trust the Taliban with uh, letting America's ha Americans have safe passage to the airport. Is that really what we're going to do? Because I have no trust and confidence in that. Uh, Dave brother says, I've, as of 2017, only the Pakistani Taliban are considered terrorists, not the Afghani Taliban. Well, look at that. That's awesome. They're no longer terrorist organization. Well, good luck with that. Yeah. I would ask you this, Alan, where do you see all this lawlessness going, whether it's here in the States with the Antifa and BLM riots of 2020, uh, what's going on in South Africa, what's going on in Afghanistan. We, we could look at multiple instances around the world where uh, whether it's caused by the pandemic or accelerated by the pandemic, where do you see the lawlessness going, sir? I don't see it ending anytime soon. I really don't. I think we've got a, a turn in people's ideologies that have manifested itself worldwide. It's not like it was um, when I was growing up. We were considered patriots back then as people who this country is out here. If you want to come in this country and make something in your life, we're here. But at the same time, we are going to defend, protect our constitution by whatever means and if it is uh, foreign or domestic. So I think the ideology, and it's not just here, it's in uh, Europe, it's in Australia, uh, even it's turned to tide a lot in some of these countries that are under communist rule. Um, I don't see the lawlessness in this conflict ending anytime soon. There has to be some type of attitude change or ideology change in people out here to be able to start a way forward getting it getting it to end that's just my opinion right now uh, again i'm not an expert but i don't see it we haven't got the people in this administration that knows what they're doing to where they can even tempt to go forward and ending something like this and healing our own people inside this country. Uh, there's still, still people. And like I said, there are some earlier, I said, uh, there are some things about, you know, not uh, totally defunding the police, but we still got pockets out here. We still got people that think that, you know, we were going in the wrong direction. Uh, that you know, we need to change everything drastically, and I don't see that as the answer. I just see that we've got to have a not only a socialistic change out here, but we got a moral change that we've got to look at too. So I see it being long term for a while. I really do. Yeah, I'm unfortunately I agree with you. You know, and as we look at uh, you know places in the West like. The, the insane lockdown rules that are going on in Australia. And if, if you're listening or watching this morning, just, just do some little research on what's going on in Sydney. You got 2 million people on uh, basically a perpetual lockdown. It's just insanity. It's almost uh, house arrest. That's the way I look at it. It's, it's basically house arrest. So. It is. And, and I don't think that's what a free society should ever do. I think it uh, sets a bad president precedent and as social animals that that's not the condition in which we are we're designed to operate and it's going to lead to greater problems i think long term but uh, only history will will judge that one of the questions i wanted to do ask you alan is given your background and uh, as a trainer and as a law enforcement officer what can our viewers this morning do to make themselves harder to kill be aware of your surroundings keep your head up on a, a swivel um 
you know, I follow John Korea just like you. You all have had some posts on it on your American Warrior Society. You've got to be aware of what's going on out here. Pay attention. We are so into our cell phones or gadgets. Uh, we don't pay attention. Uh, it doesn't take just a split second to show that you're a target out here. Uh, look again. Look at what's going on in this society. Be aware of your surroundings, not only out here on the street, but look at your house. How can you protect your house? How can you make things better? Can you secure things out here? Can you make sure the door is locked? You know, before you go running out the door, kind of look outside the door every now and then. Uh, we are creatures of habit. Do not keep in habits. You know, uh, one of the things they teach in law enforcement, I never pulled out of the driveway, I, I can either go left or right, but I never made a pattern of going one way all the time. Um, I live right here in Abingdon, got approximately three acres around. It's dark out here. I never go outside without a flashlight. Uh, you know, I carry a fl little flashlight with me a lot of times all day long. Um, if you carry, commit to carry. Exactly. Commit to carry. All right, here we go. <laughs> Mine's a little bigger, but I can use it to, you know, <laughs> understand. Um, think about where you're going, what you need to do, and the routes you take. Um, what, do, what are you in the car? I see so many people setting out, like the other day I went to the store, get some groceries. Several people were in that car, their heads down on that phone car running whether you know lock your car doors or you'll be in there lock your car doors anywhere you're at if you're in intersections stuff little things don't get right on front of the vehicle uh, in front of you if you've got to go to the atm make sure look around before you get out of your vehicle or you know just simple things like that um if you do carry make sure you can handle the firearm get the training to do it uh Nothing says you have to carry anything. What about less than lethal? What about OC? Uh, my daughter, my wife, she doesn't carry it all the time. She's scared to death of putting it off inside her pocketbook or whatever. But my daughter walks in an area up in the Shenandoah Valley that is, it's a trail, but it's very, there's not a lot of help on it. Or, you know, it's a very desolate little area. I got her some pepper spray carry with her and i'm in the process of getting her trained on how to carry a firearm so just these things are like that um, the biggest thing is just pay attention to what you're doing where you're at don't bury your face in that phone all the time that just that's an invitation showing that you're not aware of your surroundings and they have already if somebody wants to do something they've already picked you out as a target right there it's you know, what you want to do is make yourself hard to be hard to kill or be hard to be attacked. You know, um, simple processes, even what you do out here in your public life can save your life. You know, keep you from even getting seriously injured or killed. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, one of the things with, with regard to criminal uh, predation is someone that does not respect your personal space is not, respect you so you've mentioned john korea of active self-protection on youtube uh you know mike and i made a couple of videos with john korea a couple of months ago and uh he's a good 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 christian good man and um one of the, you can find those on youtube anyway one of the things i was going to say is people stepping into your space look at the coursework that craig douglas has done on managing unknown contacts how do you manage that person who's walking into your space and that often will determine whether you're going to win or win or uh, lose on this fight. I think another thing to your point is, uh, you know, keeping your head on a swivel, looking around before you go to an ATM or things of this nature. Remember what you're looking for, folks. There's a really easy acronym. I think the Marine Corps Combat Hunter program come up with the bad acronym. B plus A equals D. And I know we've talked about it on the show many times, but if you've never heard it, let me, let me break it down because I think it's it's what Alan's talking about, but it, it puts a little bit of us 
not science behind it, but a little bit of a way to conceptualize what Alan's talking about. And that is you have a baseline. Me and Alan and everybody on here knows what a, a, a convenience store looks like. I, or I'll give you another one, a laundromat. I watched one that John Korea put out yesterday and it's a laundromat. Okay. A coin operated laundromat. And there's a guy that's waiting on his clothes to dry and he's looking in the dryer, not watching around. And this guy walks in with a hatchet in his hand. Now that's, that's an, an anomaly. The baseline for a laundromat anywhere in the world is not a, a deranged looking man coming in with a hatchet in his hand. Would you agree with that, Alan? Yes, I'd agree with that. So, so that's a dangerous anomaly. You need to key in on that. And when you see that, Baseline plus an anomaly means you got to make a decision. And the decision is one of three things. And it's the three C's. You continue staring at your laundry. Good luck. You cancel the laundry and get out of there. Or you, you change something in your surroundings. You get behind cover. You change him. You do. You make a, some sort of decision, right? So everything Alan's telling you is going to preempt the fact that you're ever going to be in one of those situations, potentially if you raise your level of awareness. Now, the other thing we talked about this morning might be relevant to this. Alan, I'll ask your opinion. It's the run, hide, fight mantra, right? As far exactly. as making you harder to kill. And the final thing I would say, just to, to agree with everything you've just said, is the OC spray. Uh, I'm a huge fan of OC spray. I've sprayed dozens of people, had amazing effect with it. So if, if your gun is not right for you or a member of your family or loved one, they're not comfortable with that level of responsibility. That's fine. Don't force them to do something that they don't want to do, but get them some good training with an OC instructor like Alan. I think it can make the difference. Exactly. Uh, there's a very, very, very small percentage of the public. It does not affect. We had one in my Academy class. He licked his lips and said that tastes good on a taco, but <laughs> it did not bother him. But wow. It, it fired me up, and I That's can true. tell you from personal experience, every time it's been deployed, I've gotten a taste of it. I mean, it it will fire you up if you get a direct hit. They are distracted, and that's the biggest thing about uh, if you've got an attacker, attacker, distraction gives you an out to do that run, hide, fight thing. You know, another thing I might say to somebody out here, when you're walking, even if you're pushing a grocery cart, Get up, get your shoulders up, square it up. Don't come out leaning over it. Look around. Be that confident person. You may not be a confident person, but look like a confident person. Get up, get those shoulders up, push that thing with a purpose or carry your bags with a purpose. If somebody comes up, drop the bags, you know, and my favorite thing, if you've got somebody and you do this, they might just sense the fact, hey, you may be ready for something and they may not want any more to do with you. But hey, you know, get your hands out in front of you. People down here with their phone looking down, they're not looking, you know, every once in a while, you don't have to be swinging your head around, but every once in a while, glance over your shoulder. When you get to your vehicle, stop. Try to do just a real quick 360. Notice who's around, just like you were talking about, the guy with a hatchet. You've got a guy out here in the summer, and I didn't know this is the wardrobe of some people. you got a guy out here in the summer, and he's got a, a knee-length uh, hoodie on. You might want to pay attention to him. You know, you know uh, you kind of know what's normal for the seasons that you're around. What, how people dress. That person that dresses oddly, that may just be them being odd. That it might, you might want to pay a little bit of attention to those things. But be confident when you're out here in public. You know, look your head. A lot of times, if you're walking ahead, you don't have to look like you're constantly nervous. And that's another thing. People get too nervous. And that's another target they'll pick up. But look, you know, scan your eyes. It's real simple. So, you know, you don't have to do a whole lot to make yourself not a target out here. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, no, that's perfect. We have uh, just uh, some free resources for those watching or listening to the show. Go to AmericanWarriorSociety.com. We have hundreds of articles there. We have a 
CIA page, which is Criminal Intelligence Activity page, which tells you about different uh, crime news that are going on right now. It doesn't cost you anything to read the articles there at AmericanWarriorCited.com or take advantage of the CIA page to learn what's going on, and maybe you'll be better armed next time. Charlie says Australia started as a penal colony, and they, on average, have the prisoner's mentality of no freedom. U.S. citizens are descended of free men and women who fought uh, for it. So, yeah, well said there. Mm -hmm. Jeff brings up a great point, Alan. He says, I, I have hope that the pendulum is swinging back. They went too radical too quickly, and that may be the case. I think the, the, uh, the, the craze with the pronouns and things of that nature, eventually they start eating their young, uh, the more radical they become. Tony says, great show, gentlemen. Stay aware, stay prepared. Jesse says, I've told my sister and female friends that if they want to carry pepper spray, I would gladly let them use it on me so they can learn to use it. Wow. You're a better man than me, Jesse. I've taken all the spray, <laughs> all the spray I want to get. Charlie says, great show. Guile says, I see that all the time. People always on their phone. They are lucky if they just bump into a wall. What if they bump into a guy with a gun? Yeah. Uh, Gerald says, have you looked at the AWS website? Uh, of course, yeah. David Brothers says Left of Bang is also a great resource. It is an excellent book. And uh, Mike Seeklander and I did two shows on situational awareness. If you want to check those out, I think it could probably help you. We use some of the things from Left of Bang in that as well. Alan, any final comments for the folks that have been watching this this morning? Uh, biggest thing. Back your police officers and back your country and back the military. Uh, we're in a hole right now. I hope we can get out of, but I don't know. Uh, if you are any time in your life that you need to contact somebody in your state or federal positions of senator and representative, now would be the time to do it. We need some radical changes. And I'm not saying radical far left. We need some radical changes to support this country that we haven't had in a long time. Uh, I know I'm considered an old curmudgeon out here in some ways, but I was raised in a patriotic family. My dad served during World War II on a destroyer escort. Had one torpedoed out from under him. Um, he knows what it is to see what it takes to protect your country and to win a conflict out here. Win a conflict. End it, win it, change the world. We've got to start doing that if we get involved in this stuff. Um, pray. Uh, like I said earlier, I've relied on the good Lord a lot of times in my career. And even now, you got to have some type of guidance, and he's given me guidance, and he's been protector. It's up to him what happens to me out here. But if, you know, we, this country was supported, and I know a lot of people are not going to like this. This country was formed and supported under the terms of God we trust. We got to do something. We can't just lay on our laurels or have our hands under our butt. Uh, sitting around we got to do something got to be active out here you know it's just like in the state of virginia we've got a governor's race coming up this time and i don't know which way it's going to go but if we don't change things here in this state it's going to get even worse so support your country i don't know of any other place even with the problems we've got right here that we could be with the uh constitution the freedoms we've got but we've got to protect those if you don't like this country go to somewhere else go to china go to afghanistan go to these places go to venezuela look at what's happened with all these places that have gone the direction that some of these people in the country want to go it's not a pretty sight um that you know i just i'm concerned I'm, i guess i'm worried about the direction our country's going in and unless we, the people, do something, it's not going to change. So You're here. Yeah. So we've got to do it. It's not going to be me. It's not going to be you, Rich. It's going to be all of us. So 
God bless everybody out here. <clears throat> uh, stay safe. Watch your six. And uh, that's basically where I'm going at. Well, thank you, Alan, for being on the show. And thanks for everybody that watched or listened to the podcast or saw this on uh, Coffee with the Rich YouTube channel. Thank you so much for being on the show this morning, Alan. I uh, greatly appreciate it. I always enjoy sitting down with you, sir. Oh, thank you. It's been an honor. I, I feel like I'm just a regular person out here. I'm not as educated or not as uh, well-informed like a lot of your guests, but uh, I do care about what we do here in this country. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for your service to, to your community up there in Virginia and everything that you're doing right now as an instructor, keeping people safe. We really appreciate it. It means a lot, brother. And uh, everybody out there watching this morning, remember the fight is coming. Be ready.